Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. I want to pick up in verse 3 and work our way through verse 14. It's been stated by many that verse 3 is the beginning of a sentence. And the sentence then continues on. It's it's a statement, a paragraph, a sentence, a one-breath liner, if you will, all the way to verse 14. And so I want to read this, verses 3 through 14, and then we'll work our way back and just listen to what Paul says. So we looked last week as we were here, an introduction to who Paul the Apostle is, though we know exactly who he is. Just by way of reminder, we considered his apostleship. We considered that his apostleship was brought by the will of God, that he was made an apostle by the Lord, and really the power and the beauty of that. Here we see his apostolic authority. And then he calls the believers in Ephesus saints. And this is both Jews and Gentiles. Uh, This is a broad group of people. It's not just a specific church. It's in the area of Asia Minor. This letter has obviously circulated around. And ultimately, we see here that then he prays this prayer of blessing upon them. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he goes on to say these words. Follow along with me. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as He chose us in Him before the foundations of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ Himself, according to the good pleasure of His will, to the praise of the glory of His grace by which He made us accepted in the beloved. In Him we have redemption through His blood and the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace, which He made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mysteries of His will according to His good pleasure, which He purposed in Himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who walks, who works, excuse me, all things according to the counsel of his will. That we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. In him you also trusted. After you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of His glory. When we look at this here, we see in verse 3 the word here, blessed. This is an outburst of praise. And Paul here is starting his letter, not only addressing it to the saints in Ephesus or Asia Minor for that matter, and reminding them that the grace of the Lord God is what he's praying. He's praying that they would experience, that there would be grace toward the people of Ephesus, these Ephesian believers, so to speak, and those of Asia Minor. But the thought that we looked at last time is we see here also the emphasis of peace as well. Grace to you and peace from God our Father. When there is no grace, there is no peace. You could never experience the peace of God apart from the grace of God because it is the grace of God that opens us up to understanding and knowing what peace with God is like. As a matter of fact, we see that he builds upon this with the same idea. This is part of what he says here, that the Lord God in Christ Jesus has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Part of the spiritual blessings is peace. Peace with God. When one has peace with God, everything changes. Ultimately, we understand and know what it is to be at peace with ourselves, to be at peace with others, 
And we looked at the spiritual blessings. We exhausted that last time we were here, the benefits and the privileges that we have. But just by way of reminder, here's just a couple that we're going to see here just in the first couple of chapters of Ephesians, that we are chosen and adopted by the Father. I think that's an important truth and a very profound spiritual blessing. But we also see, too, that the Bible also here reminds us in the same chapter, in chapter 1, that we are redeemed by the Son. And then we also see in the same 14 verses that we are looking at that at the close of these verses, it says that we are also sealed by the Spirit. And then Paul reminds his readers that every single one of us receive resurrecting power or resurrected power. You know, the fact that Jesus was raised from the dead promises us that we will be raised. The fact that Jesus had power from the Father. Because we are co-heirs with Christ, the believer, the church, we have power. And I believe here that Paul begins to build on this very truth because remember, as he wrote to, to the Ephesians or the people here in Asia Minor, especially in regards to where he is, he said it very clearly that there was opportunity, that a door had been opened. And his desire was to remain in the area of Asia Minor to continue to do the work that God's called him to do. But we also see that he also says that there was great trials with much tears and trials in Acts chapter 20. Paul endeavored to walk through these doors of opportunity that God opened with the understanding, too, that with great opportunity comes great trials. Now, this was very encouraging, I would say, because this is where the spiritual or the heavenly blessings come in. They encourage us. They strengthen us. They remind us. We also see here that according to chapter 1 in verses 15 through 23, that some of the heavenly blessing is that the Lord, by way of his Holy Spirit, gives us eyes to see the Lordship of Jesus. When you and I understand the Lordship of Christ, once again, like peace, it changes everything. We also see here that we were brought from death to life through faith in Christ. We see that in chapter 2, in verses 1 through 10. And that we are also raised and seated with Christ in chapter 2. It reminds us not only of our DNA, but our position in Christ. And ultimately, what we were created for. The Bible says in chapter 2 and verse 10, For we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. In other words, you and I were created for good works. Now there's some wording here that we're going to look at tonight just for the sake of, of looking at what we are considering here that sometimes people really struggle with. There's some passages here that, for the most part, have caused some debate. And the words that we're going to be looking at is the word predestined, um, the word here, uh, God has chosen us from the foundations uh, of the world. You know, this has been something that people have wrestled with, election, predestination. I just want to tell you, there's no need to wrestle with those words. They're biblical. They're in the Bible. And I would say that if you take whatever school of thought, as some would say, well, you know, this is a, you know, favorite passage of scripture for the reformers, uh, those that get behind, you know, Arminianism. Here's the Arminius view. Well, I'll tell you guys, neither view is in mind here. You can't support either view here. What we have here is the biblical view of what predestination and election is. What I think is interesting here is that Paul reminds them of, I think, an important truth. As we read these verses, he reminds them of God's work. God is at work. God is the one doing the work within them. In other words, we see here in verses 3 down to verse 14, really the Trinitarian nature, if you will, of the passage. And what is the triune nature or the Trinitarian nature? Well, the opening verse... Really, they're, they're Trinitarian. Paul mentions at the very start of chapter 1, he says, God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he speaks of every spiritual blessing alluding to the work and ministry of the Holy Spirit. God the Father, 
God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And he doesn't stop there. Because in verses 3 through 6, he says here that we are chosen by the Father. In verses 7 through 10, he says we are redeemed by the Son. And in verses 11 through 14, he says we are assured or we are sealed by the Spirit. And I think if we can understand here the structure, I think we'll understand a great truth of this great work, really the emphasis on the work of the Father, the emphasis on the work of the Son, and the emphasis on the work of the Holy Spirit. In a sense, you could see that what Paul is doing is he's drawing their attention to something that is far greater than them and more powerful than they could ever imagine. Now, listen, they are living in a day and age where power is present before them. The power of idolatry is present, especially in Ephesus. Let's just put it that way. With the worship of the false goddess. Uh, Artemis and Diana, right? And, and so the people around them draw power from these false things. And Paul is saying the power that we have is far greater than the power that the world has to offer. The start of his letter, Paul says, no man chose me, God chose me. And he reinforces God's choosing by teaching them that we all have been chosen by God. You know, there's one thing to say that you're this in the Lord, but it's another thing to demonstrate to the body of Christ that we are chosen by the Lord, that we are co-heirs with Christ. And I love the picture here. Why? Because in a sense, Paul is calling his readers of those of Asia Minor and the body of Christ to this praise to the triune God from whom all blessings flow. Then he also kind of takes him in how the spiritual blessings in Christ will, you know, it appears 11 times in this verse, time and time again. These are the spiritual blessings. And I think it encourages that that Paul also points out that the salvation of the believer ultimately is for God's glory. That God works out salvation in us, both to will and to do for his good pleasure. And he also highlights the grace of God in salvation. Now, I want us to understand something here. He says this in verse 6, to the praise of the glory of his grace by which he has made us accepted in the beloved. You know, this would be really encouraging because a lot of times what this does is it, it reminds us how salvation has come. It's not come by any way that, that we have done it. It hasn't come by, you know, our means or our doing. And listen, sometimes we would like to take the credit for the good that's taking place in our lives right now. But we can't. This is why there's always a stern warning to never take credit for the work of the Holy Spirit because we can change nobody, only God can. I just read something somebody had just posted. They says, you know, I need to stop thinking I can save people. Salvation is of the Lord and Him alone. I'll tell you what, just a food for thought. Listen to this, guys. It is a lifting of the burden. It is a relief when you understand that God's the one who does the work and not us. That doesn't mean that God doesn't use us in his work, but we can change no one. Notice what Paul does. So he reminds them of their DNA in Christ, who we are in Christ. And he makes it very clear. Look at the end of verse 3. He says, that he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. And notice the emphasis here, two words, in Christ. So the obvious here is that outside of Christ, these spiritual blessings do not exist. And he begins to explain how it is that we are recipients of such great grace, right? And I think it's important for us to look at this. Well, he says here that this comes about by the Father's choosing. We are new in Christ. And he says, just as he chose us in him before the foundations of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. How can he choose us before the foundations of the world? Two words in verse 5, having predestined us. 
So the picture, I think, is important that nobody gets into heaven at all whatsoever by his own good merits or his own good ways. Listen, we hope and wish that it would be that easy, but it's never by our doing. It reminds me of a story of a man trying to get into heaven, and the man died and went to heaven, and he stood before Peter at the pearly gates. Peter said to him, why should I let you into heaven? The guy said, well, I try to help other people. Peter says, can you give me an example of somebody you helped? He said, sure. I once was in a roadside diner, and a group of hell's angels were in there bothering a little old lady. They had knives and guns and were scaring everyone in the place. So I stepped up to the leader, spun him around and punched him in his face and said, Hey, why don't you leave that little lady alone? And while you're at it, you and your filthy friends clear out of here and get on your bikes and ride away. Peter said, Wow, that was pretty brave. When did this happen? He said, About five minutes ago. <laughs> Some of you will get that later. But see, there's nothing we can do to make heaven our home by our own doing. There's nothing you and I can do to stand before the Lord and really say, God, you know, we're here because we, because I, because him, because they. Ultimately, even Jesus Christ, God has chosen to be the sacrifice at the same time that he chose us before the foundations of the earth. Look at what the Bible says in Revelation chapter 13. Turn there very quickly. Revelation 13. I just want you to look at this here. And look at verse 8. It says, All who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names have been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Jesus Christ is the Lamb. And he's slain from where? the foundations of the world. In other words, this was a part of God's purpose and plan. See, everybody thinks the game changed in the Garden of Eden. No, the Garden of Eden and what transpired with the fall of man just set things in motion. There's never been a plan B. It's always been plan A. Why? Because God's foreknowledge. God predestined. God elects. And God chooses. All throughout Scripture we see God chose Abraham. Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Jot it down. God also, uh, you know, he chose Israel as a nation. This is what the apostles were stating there in Acts, uh, or Deuteronomy chapter 7 in verses 6 through 8. In Deuteronomy 14 in verse 2. Isaiah 42 in verses 6 through 8. God also in Jesus Christ, chose the disciples. Remember what Jesus told them in John chapter 15 and verse 16? He says, you didn't choose me, I chose you. And I appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain. I love what Paul the Apostle says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Many of you here tonight, this is your life verse. That God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise, right? So listen, God chooses Abraham. God chooses Israel as a nation. Jesus chooses his disciples. God chooses the foolish things of the world. God chooses individual people. Romans chapters 9 through 11 says that. And, and what does verse 29 says? That the gifts and callings of God are what? Irrevocable. Now for you and I today, guys, listen, this is why I think sometimes we fail to realize the privileged position we have as adopted children of God. God chose you. You know what I love about God choosing us? He chose us when nobody else wanted us. I think that's pretty powerful. I don't know about you guys. But not only does he choose us and he finds us where we are, then he blesses us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You see, in Christ, everything changes. In Christ, it, it, it is, we are not only a new creation, but we also experience the spiritual blessings. And he chose us before the foundations of the earth. Now, if we for a moment can kind of consider this passage here, I think it's something that we have to really understand. 
that the Lord elects. John Stott, I love this, on his uh, take here on Ephesians 1, this is what he says. This is a primary truth. John Stott says, A man known for measured sensibility says the doctrine of election is a divine revelation, not a human speculation. It was not dreamed up by Martin Luther or John Calvin or St. Augustine or by the Apostle Paul for that matter. It is not to be set aside as an imagination of some overactive religious minds, but rather humbly accepted as a revelation, however mysterious it may be. From God, we must never allow our subjective experience of choosing Christ to water down the fact that we would not have chosen Him if He had not first chosen us. The doctrine of election presents us with a God who defies finite analysis. It is a doctrine that lets God be God. You see, we at times can miss what the Lord is clearly teaching us here. In a sense, we look at this and we say, man, Lord, you've chosen me. Exactly. God has chosen you. Well, why would God choose somebody like you? Why would God choose somebody like me? Well, notice what he says here. Just as he chose us in him before the foundations of the world, that we should, listen to this, be holy and without blame before him in love. God chose us for his glory. Now, tonight, if you were to understand this truth, I think that you would get a clear understanding of your position in Christ. This is what Paul is emphasizing with them. So remember, we stated John chapter 15, verse 16, you did not choose me, but I chose you, appointed you, that you might go and bear fruit and that your fruit would last. And so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. Whatever you ask in my name. See, a lot of people a lot of times go to this whole thing and they start saying, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. But the thought behind in the name, Jesus constantly reiterates this same passage of Scripture with that thought there with anything you ask according to the will of the Father, he will give you in my name. So I remember years ago, and I quote this book quite a bit, R.A. Torrey on prayer. He says it in there. God will answer every single prayer if you pray according to His will. Not your will, His will. There'll never be an answer, no. God will always answer according to His purpose, His plan, and His will. Here in verse 4, we see that Paul the Apostle says that He chose us before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in His sight. Look at what 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9 says. Jot it down if you're taking notes. It says, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of Him who called you, I love this here, out of darkness into His wonderful light. It's undeniable, at least by Peter's response here, or this passage of Scripture, that God has chosen those who are believers in Jesus. Why this? Is there something about me or special about me that led God to choose me? No, the answer is no. Notice the emphasis here in verse 3. The last two words are in Christ. And hasn't it not occurred to you in the same way that God has chosen us before the foundations of the earth, He also crucified the Lamb before the foundations of the earth? It's something that we kind of look at and we say, so what do you mean? It happened before it happened? That's exactly what I mean. Because we think in terms of, well, it it can only happen until it happened. Not from God's vantage point. He is God. God's not waiting for a point in time. Listen to this, for it to take place. No, listen, when we look at from earth's vantage point, yes, God's timing is perfect. But God's not up in heaven with a time clock, right? He's not looking at things and saying, okay, I got to do this by 830. If I don't do this by 830, it's all, no. What God does is he, his work, his will, his purpose, his plan, as he speaks it, he speaks it from eternity, not time. From eternity into time. And because of God's foreknowledge and because of who God is, 
It's perfect in all he does. Listen, God's not constrained by time. Just put it that way. So whether he does it at, and I'm just figuratively speaking, 830 or 831, it's perfect. Because it's by God's doing. Now, in all this here, we see this, that he chose us out of his love and out of his mercy. And what does he say here? For his glory. It goes on to say here in Ephesians 1 that in love he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Christ Jesus in accordance to the pleasure of his will and the praise of his glorious grace. He has freely given us the privilege, the goodness, and the grace in the one that he loves. And we see that God's choosing is linked to his love. Now, with all of this here, we ask the question, why would God choose somebody like me? Well, I think that God choosing us really is something that gives him pleasure and brings him praise. It's God who works in you, both to will and to do for his good pleasure. And we praise the Lord. It highlights his gracious character. It shows his character, his nature, his heart, not our merit. Kind of like the guy who tried to get in by a good deed. Ultimately, the good deed got him into eternity, but didn't get him into heaven. Some people say, well, I'm a very good person. I lived a a good life. I've, I've never murdered nobody, but you've lied and you cheated. You need the grace of God through the person and work of Jesus Christ in order to make heaven your home. That's just how it goes. Nobody gets in on their own. We are not saved because of our good works. Look at what the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2 and verses 8 and 9. It says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Imagine people in heaven saying, I'm here because I was just good. Would that be heaven? No way. I'll tell you what, the ones that are there, let's just say if that was the case, the ones that are there for their good work, they would look at us who came through Christ Jesus and they would say, you didn't do enough. And they would look at the work of the cross as not good enough. This is what makes the work of the cross so profound. And this is here what I believe Paul is reminding the Ephesian believers about and those in this area, reminding them, listen to this, you're not saved because of your good works. We're all sinners. We all fail to measure up to God's glory. Romans 3.23, right? It reminds us of this truth. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And apart from Jesus, all of us deserve what? We deserve death. That's what Romans 6.23 says, right? For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So in other words, we were brought from death to life through faith in Christ Jesus. That's what verses 1 through 10 are about there in chapter 2. These are important. Why, guys? Because if we start to look at this and we say, why do we have to reiterate and emphasize this so much? Because there's a response to being chosen. My question to you today is, as here Paul is speaking to these Ephesian believers, and he's saying, now as we work through the rest of these verses here, what's your response? Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9, it indicates the proper response to being chosen by God. Look at the response here in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, listen to this, a people for his own possession that you may proclaim the excellence of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And I love this here. Our lives should be a life that shows the gratitude and the grace of God by our praise. Praise and worship is not just the 30 minutes set before the teaching. It's a lifestyle. A life lived for the glory of the Lord. God not only chose us for his glory, but God also chose us that we would join him in his work. Notice that we looked at verse 10, for we are his workmanship, created for Jesus in good works, what God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. 
God chose us in advance. Listen to this. For us to do this great work. If you really think about it, guys, for me, that's even more mind-blowing that, that God would choose someone like us. Choose us to be blameless, to be holy. And he chooses us because he has a purpose in mind for our lives. Ultimately, we see here that God choosing time and time again, as we illustrated here with Abraham and the nation of Israel and Jesus and the disciples, the insignificant. God does this out of love, not because of something impressive about Abraham or the nation or the disciples or the individual. He says he chooses the foolish things of the world. Some would say, you know, um, I'm not qualified some people have that attitude. I'm not qualified for God to use me. In other words, you're saying then you were chosen by God because of qualities. We're chosen by God because of his grace. Every single one of us. And that should change how we respond to the Lord. Because our entire lives, we, we live it according to what we do and what we don't do. What we have and what we don't have. With the Lord God, he's like, that was never the motivator for me. As a matter of fact, here's what I love about this. I chose you before you had or didn't have. Before the foundations of the earth. I love this here. So then he goes on to say in verse 5, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ and himself according to the good pleasure of his will. So here we see his very nature as to why he did this the goodness of God, the good pleasure of his will. And he goes on to say here, to the praise of the glory of his grace. So I love this. Here's the ultimate purpose of election. It's to the glory of his praise or grace by which he made us accepted in the beloved. In other words, divine grace. How are we accepted in the beloved? The person and work of Christ that we're all recipients of the same sacrifice that was made. Nobody paid more. Nobody paid less. Nobody got in through the way. Remember, Jesus kind of gives the parable of, of, you know, those that try to go in the sheepfold some other way. He says only thieves and liars do that. Nobody gets in any other way except through the door. And he talks about, then he goes on to even say that he is the door. And I think the picture that is really fitting here is that this here, I believe, is building a case. Now, you guys might say, what does this all mean? Election and predestination before the foundations of the earth and all of these things according to his good pleasure. And his, I think this is leading up to the assurance of the believer. Not only is this probably misunderstood in both camps of what does this picture mean? How does this, how does this work for those who, who are chosen by God before the foundations of the earth? Well, well, the reality is that God the Father chooses us in Christ. That's exactly what he's saying here. And while he does this, this is in accordance to the pleasure of his will. Well, this is God's will. And historically, you know, as I stated earlier, there are two interpretations of this. But I think that in all of this, it leads us to understanding our position in Christ, who we are in him. Yes, we know a new creation. We know this. But there's something profoundly reassuring. So the teachings of Calvinism would teach that God's choosing means that the believer has nothing to do with his own salvation. Even the faith of the believer itself is a gift. But the believer has nothing to do with his salvation. Ultimately, this is all by God's doing. That even, that even the believer cannot even resist the grace of God. It's called irresistible grace. But I've seen many resist the grace of God. I resisted the grace of God before I came to faith in Christ. And then the other view, the Armenian teaching, would emphasize the believer's choice. And suggest that God's choice was was based on God's knowledge of what the believer would choose. I have an issue with that too. Because then that's not really God choosing. 
That's God saying, I already knew what you were going to choose, so I chose you. You know, when you get into this whole debate as to Calvinism and Armenianism, and, you know, these are the five points of Calvinism, just historically study these two schools of thought. The five points of Calvinism were a rebuttal to the five points of Armenianism. I reject both. I believe that you can be sound biblically if you just stay within the parameters of Scripture. And I think there are healthy things on both sides that if you try not to read into the Scriptures or follow a school of thought, just follow Jesus. Because I don't think there's an issue with saying that we have been predestined or elected. It's biblical. And I remember having a conversation with a guy where he's like, well, you know, you believe that you have free will. And I says, yes. He goes, but how is it that you believe you have free will and yet God predestined you or elected you? Most people would be like, oh, yeah. I just says, I says, listen, in his sovereignty, in his election, in his predestination, God has given me free will. That doesn't change anything. Well, so you mean that God doesn't know the outcome? Ultimately, God does know the outcome. I'm the one that doesn't. And in his infinite grace and in his infinite love, God didn't create robots. He created people in his image and in his likeness. And I'll tell you what, I might not know the details like I don't know the details of the Trinity, but God's word teaches it, so I believe it. The problem is you want to write the manual on the doctrine of election and predestination and take the credit for knowing what it is. This is a mystery of God. Something you and I will never understand, like how God wrapped himself in human flesh and came by way of the Holy Spirit into the womb of a young virgin and then was born as a man, came to this world to die for your sins. Conversation ended there. But I believe there's a third picture here that I think we can gather from this. If we look at this, we begin to see here that Paul asserts here that God has chosen us before the foundations of the earth. And I think that that is amazing. I think it's good. I think it's important. But I believe here that God expresses his sovereignty. He chooses us before the foundation of the world, and he places the responsibility of faith upon the individual. This is what I see here in verse 8. For by grace you have been saved, chapter 2, through faith, that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. And what I see here is what I've always believed about predestination and election, that both the sovereignty of God and the responsibility of humanity is evident. And Paul's letter to the Ephesians, I believe, is his explanation of how we came to be so greatly blessed. You were chosen by God. You know, Christians don't walk in that blessing. Not only are you chosen by God, you know, we have to get on this topic because it's here. Look at what he goes on to say here. He says, in him we have redemption, verse 7, through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. So we move from being chosen by the Father, elected, predestined, the foreknowledge of God, you know, the, the sovereignty of God, and all of this here, God's goodness, God's grace. And then this is the means by which God does it. No other way which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence. I love this here because he's saying in understanding, having made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself. That in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ. When is he going to gather together in one all things in Christ? It says the dispensation. The word dispensation means a period of time. A time is going to come when all those who are in Christ are going to be gathered up. It has to do with the second coming of Jesus Christ. That the whole purpose is that we would be with him. He, Jesus says it in his priestly prayer. This is no you know, new news. This is not new light. Jesus prayed, Father, that, that they may be one as we are one. Ultimately, Jesus' prayer leads to not only us being one, as he and the Father are one, but that ultimately we would be with the Lord. I mean, in all of this here, we see, once again, that the purpose of God choosing and then the purpose of God redeeming or purchasing us through his Son, 
Now brings us to this place where it says here that ultimately it's heading toward a goal. Our lives are no longer ours, but they're in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on the earth in him. So I love this picture when it says here, these heavenly blessings. Guys, listen, in all of this, we got to look at where we are as Christians. Yes, we, we are here living in this world until either we go home by death or rapture is what we say, right? But while we're here on this earth, guys, listen, the heavenly, the, he the spiritual blessings, well, what does that mean? Well, they are spiritual, not material. They are heavenly, they're not earthly. They are eternal, and they are not temporal. So in a sense, we live in a fallen world, redeemed by the blood of His Son, Jesus, given a new name, a new character, a new nature. We become a new creation, 2 Corinthians 5, 7. And then we inherit by his work of the cross, all the spiritual blessings. And guys, we are to walk in these spiritual blessings until the gathering of all the saints. Ultimately, the goal that we're going to. I look at this here in verses 3 through 10 in something Jesus says in John chapter 15. Going back to this whole thing of Jesus saying to the disciples, you didn't choose me, I chose you. Let me kind of give you this picture here so you can jot this down and take your notes on this. But notice what he says here. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. Now you see the word there, fruit, is the Greek word karpos. The Greek word karpos, K-A-R-P-O-S. Now, I think that's interesting. You might say, well, what does that have to do with anything? We're, you know, we don't speak Greek here, you know, and, but I want to help you with something. The, the, the word karpos in the original language, the Greek language, is actually the base word for the Greek word harpazo. And we find the word harpazo in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 17, right? That we will be caught up. The word there, caught, is the... The Greek word, harpazo, it, it means a violent snatching away. And what's interesting is that he goes on to say here, and that your fruit should remain. You see the word there, remain, in the Greek is the Greek word, meneo. And that word means to endure and to stay. That whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. Now let's look at it from this understanding of these two words and how Jesus is stating this. I think this is pretty remarkable. Jesus says, I chose you, you didn't choose me, and I appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain. What do you mean? Your fruit should remain until I harpazo, until I take you up. I will call you, I will choose you, I will ordain you, and my calling, my choosing, and my ordaining will remain in you until the time that we are gathered up. This is why I believe here this picture is very fitting for what Paul is stating. See, another thing I want to tell you guys is, listen, if you truly walk in the DNA of Christ that we are given through the work of the cross, you won't have to strive to serve Jesus. Walk in the Father's predestination and election. Walk in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, knowing that we bring nothing to the table but our sin. And when the Bible says that when Christ, you know, was crucified, we were put to death. And when it says that he was raised, that we were raised. Why does the Bible say that? Because your sin and my sin was placed upon him in a preeminent way and in a very spiritual way, in a predestined and elected way before the foundations of the earth, you probably won't understand this, but the Bible clearly teaches, in essence, we were there because our sin was laid upon him. But the church doesn't walk around like that today. 
We're so fixated on what we have and what we don't have and how much we have and how much we don't have. And the Christian life becomes this life of striving and battling when it should be a life of grace and peace, resting in the finished work of Christ and living for his glory. And your life should produce the fruit of praise, knowing that you have been chosen by the Father and purchased by the Son, sealed by the Spirit, blessed God, three in one. You see, this is what Paul is encouraging them with. So Jesus says, you didn't choose me, I chose you and I appointed you that you go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain. Now I want to talk about the third thing that we see here. So we're chosen by the Father, we are purchased by the Son, we are sealed by the Spirit. Look at verse 11. In Him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of Him who works all things according to the counsel of His will that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed you were sealed. I love this verse, with the Holy Spirit of promise. Can I just propose something to you? Did you seal yourself? Who sealed you? The Lord God. We are sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise. Who is powerful enough to break the seal of the Holy Spirit? You're not. I already know some of you are like, oh no, here. I know where he's going with this. If none of us are powerful enough to break the seal, think on the context of the love of God. Is the love of God, as we just looked at here, we've been chosen because of His love and His mercy, right? And His grace. Is there greater power in the love of God and the sealing of the Holy Spirit, or are they one and the same? They're one and the same. It's the reality and it's the truth. The work and ministry of the Holy Spirit in our lives is the outputting and the display of God's love. This is what Paul emphasized to the Corinthian believers in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. It's called the love chapter. For what reason? He says, you can demonstrate all these things, but if you have not love, it profits nothing. He says, I will show you a more excellent way, right? Before he gets into chapter 13 at the close of chapter 12. He says, desire the best gift, but I will show you a more excellent way. What is more excellent than all these gifts? He says, love. And the Bible says in John's epistle that God is love, and those who don't love don't know God. They're one and the same. They're consistent. Romans 8 says, what can separate us from the love of God? You know what the answer is? Nothing. You know what part I appreciate the most? I, I, don't get me wrong, I love Paul's words, and height and depth and all these things, but I love what he says, nor any created thing. Are you a created thing, yes or no? Isn't that profound? That we couldn't even separate ourselves from the love of, you guys ain't getting this. But anyways, let's, let's get over here. We're going to get back over here because just think on that, just think on that note, the seal, right? Now listen to this. Now I want us to understand something because people always say things like, you know, well, what about our salvation? I know the question. It'll either be text to me on Messenger or email to me. Pastor, you said this in your sermon. I, I get it, guys. You, you, you know, you want to listen to what I say, but listen to this. Can the believer lose their salvation? If it is a gospel of works then that's exactly what you will embrace. Anybody that has been preached the gospel of works will always believe you could lose your salvation. The Bible doesn't preach a gospel of works. It preaches a gospel of grace. You didn't save yourself, so how can you lose what you didn't give yourself? If God has predestined you and God has elected you, and through the work of His Son Jesus at Calvary's cross, has sealed you by the Holy Spirit of promise. Now, I already know, people are going to start to, oh man, He believes in eternal security, that we can say that we are Christians and then live like the devil and still make heaven our home. The Bible doesn't teach that, and that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is we are eternally secure. 
And I know the common, typical teaching in, is if we abide, that word if. Now, that's not the common norm. Not every denomination believes that, the topic of abiding. Well, what happens to those who don't abide? Then the implication there is the moment you stop abiding, you lose it. I have issues with that too because the Bible doesn't say that. On the topic of Jesus saying, I am the vine and you are the branches, and he talks on whoever abides in me and I in him, and whoever does not abide in him, the implication is not somebody who once abided and is no longer abiding. The implication is clear that the branch never abided in the vine. And he says it. You can't do it on your own. Why would he say that? Because it's refusing to abide in the vine. Ultimately, what's going to happen? You will be removed and you will be cast out. So people ask this question to me all the time. It always comes up. Can a Christian lose their salvation? According to Scripture, I don't believe they can. It's not what the Bible teaches. Now, I already know that the, they throw everything at me. You know, what about when he says in Revelation, and I will not blot your name out? Read it in the original language. It's a statement. Jesus is declaring that he's not like earthly kings who immediately will just blot your name out. God doesn't play games with his salvation. God says, I'm not like an earthly king. I am the king of kings. I don't go around blotting names out. You have the Lamb's book of life and you have the book of eternal life. Everybody's written in the book of life. Every name, believer and non-believer. In the Lamb's book of life, the names of those that have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ are written there. There's even a book of remembrance. That's what the psalmist teaches. So the question is, can one lose his salvation? Some say, well, if we cannot lose our salvation, if it is truly eternally secure in the finished work of Christ, then why does the Bible warn so strongly against apostasy? Well, you first have to understand what an apostate is. Biblically speaking, an apostate has never been anyone that has truly put faith in Christ. An apostate, let me give you a perfect example of an apostate. Judas Iscariot followed Jesus, even his teachings, but never received the teachings of Christ. Knew the lingo, knew the language, hung around. It looked good, it sounded good, but when the time came, like the Bible says very clearly in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 19, it says, They went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. But their going showed that none of them belonged to us. There's a lot of people like that. An apostate is one who has shown some belief in the Lord in the things of God, and then later on, whatever in life, they say, I don't believe that. Well, if you didn't believe it, or you don't believe it now, you never truly accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior. In all of this here, I love this picture because what Paul is saying to them is saying, listen, be encouraged and be reminded that this great work that has taken place in your life, listen, guys, it cannot be threatened. It's a sad walk as a Christian to live your life every day of your Christian life where you're supposed to be enjoying every spiritual blessing and you're walking around like, man, if you sneeze, you got to go to the altar at the altar call. What kind of salvation is that? What kind of Christianity is that? And then people say, well, what about those Christians? And I see them in church raising their hand. Listen, you're not God. But I'll tell you what, a true believer, their lifestyle will show it. The Holy Spirit is at work in the believer's life. And you might say, well, so you mean there's counterfeits? Yes, Jesus talked about it. The wheat and the tares. Why do you think at the end he has to separate the sheep from the goat? Hello, church. And you might say, well, am I a Christian? That's a good question. But it's only one that the Lord answers through his word, not anything that we answer. I mean, we can judge a person's fruit. We do it all the time. Hey, that is inconsistent with the Christian faith. But that doesn't mean a person doesn't know the Lord. I, I don't know a Christian today that does not in some way or has not in some way sinned at least once or twice or more for that matter or daily for that matter. 
This whole picture here that I think is important, guys, is for us to understand that there is more work that goes into salvation than we realize. For us to try to grasp this whole thing and then live our lives on the cusp of the answer of this question, can you or can you not lose it? We diminish the power of the cross. We lose sight that we are chosen by the Father. How amazing is that? We lose sight that God gave up his very best for us to be purchased by his son. And then God says, that's not it. Not only have I chosen you and purchased you, I have sealed you. With the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance? Guys, listen, God gives us eternal life, not temporary life. This, this is the big difference here. This is why I often think of that when people say, you know, we're going to be surprised to who we see in heaven. Most likely we will. Because we love to make that judgment, right? We love to do that. Here's what I often say. Don't worry about whether your neighbor is saved or not saved in the context of whether they can lose or not lose their salvation. Continue to be the example God's called you to be. You'll do far better work and a way better job if you stop creating your own ministry called Fruit Inspector. <laughs> and you just live out the fruit of the Spirit in your life. Because I'll tell you what, there have been people that I've truly looked at and I said, there's no way this person is born again. And I start getting in the whole feeling things. I'm just not feeling it, man. They got a bad vibe. And then all of a sudden, I hear them share the word of God, and it's like, oh, yeah, they know God. They know God. There's a difference in knowing Bible verses and quoting Bible and knowing the Lord God. It emanates. It comes out of when you share his word. There is a reality that this person has had an encounter with Jesus Christ. Why? Because it is spiritual. It's not intellectual. It's the power of the Holy Spirit. I know there's strong warnings for apostasies, but guys, listen. We have to understand that that has to do with a person that abandons religious beliefs. Just because a person is religious doesn't mean they're born again. You say that. I say that. We know that to be true. That's an apostate, abandoning their religious beliefs. <laughs> Ultimately, the question, too, is asked... What about those people in Matthew chapter 7 where Jesus says, not all who call upon my name, Lord, Lord, will inherit the kingdom of God. Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through 23. We fail to realize what Jesus says. Not all who call upon my name, Lord, Lord, will inherit the kingdom of God, except he who does the will of my Father in heaven. There's the exception. He who does the will of my Father in heaven. Why? To do the will of God is consistent with a person that has truly been born again. One of the identifiers of the work and ministry in the life of an individual is their desire to do God's will, not their will. And they live their lives according to the will of God. And he says, and in that day, many will come to me and say, Lord, have we now prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, done many wonders in your name? And on that day, I'll declare to them, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. That's a pretty powerful statement. But what is Jesus stating here when they go to him and they say, we did this and we did that and we did this and we, we did it in your name. So did the seven sons of Sceva. And what happened to them? It's pretty powerful, guys. That... Matthew chapter 7 has always been a gut checker for me. Like, man, Lord, I want to make sure I'm in your will. Because I want to do, God, what you've called me to do. And I find that the will of God is kind of like Paul's word to, you know, the Ephesians when he's writing them there in, in Corinthians. He says, an effective, effective open door, you know, has been opened for me. There's great ministry opportunity, but this place is wild. And persecution is crazy here right? The will of God is that. It's opportunity and trials to follow. Nobody wants to go through the ways of trial. We want to we go through the door of opportunity because we love what comes with this, right? But trial is what shapes us. 
produces in us things that we could never do. And by the work and ministry of the Holy Spirit, His seal and His work in us, guys, listen, this is what salvation is. It's justification. Sanctification ultimately leading to glorification. Well, there's quite a bit that we can say on that. I don't want to end there tonight. I'll have a whole lot more to say on the topic of salvation and eternal security. What I love about this teaching, guys, is this. It's not a non-essential, so stop, you know, or it's a non-essential, stop treating it as an essential. Whether you believe you can or you cannot does not define whether you're a believer or not. Too many make it unessential. Well, you better believe you can lose it. I'm not into that grace, grace, grace. I'm into that grace, grace, grace. I thank God by His grace I'm here tonight standing and sharing His word. And because I understand the grace of God, it pushes me and drives me even more so to serve the Lord and live for Him and do His will. God's grace has never tempted me. As Paul would warn us, don't use the grace of God as a cloak. God's grace has never tempted me to push the envelope to see how far I can go because after all, I'm under grace. That means that I'm not, I'm not serving the Lord. I'm going the way of an apostate. I don't know what it is to truly walk with Jesus. Oh, I follow his teachings, but I don't follow him. Isn't that what Judas did? Church, you were chosen by the Father, purchased by the Son, sealed by the Spirit, blessed God, three in one. Amen? What great grace, man. This is our DNA. We look at this and people say, you know, what are you? See, I'm Christian. What does that mean? You're religious? You're a fanatic? No, I love Jesus with all my heart. Why? Because he died for my sins. God in his infinite love and his infinite grace chose me when nobody else wanted me. Didn't see and doesn't see who I was, but sees the work of his son, Jesus Christ, and takes me from the filth and the cesspool of sin and closes me in the righteousness of his son, Jesus. And then what does he do? He seals it and signifies it by the power and work and ministry of his Holy Spirit. That's why Paul says, I am what I am by the grace of God. I love the Lord that he takes people like me and you And says, I will, not can, I will use you for my honor and for my glory. Have you guys ever wondered why? Has this thought ever occurred to you reading through the book of Acts? Anybody here? Just be honest. Don't worry, you're not going to get in trouble if you raise your hands. I know you guys think that I like to trap you. But raise your hand if you ever had this question. How come we don't see these miracles in the book of Acts happening today? in the church. Raise your hand if you've ever thought that. Hey, go, go ahead, raise your hand. Some of you are like, well, I don't know. Listen, you do. Look around. There's not one person in here tonight in this place that has become born again by their doing. It's all been a miraculous work of God's grace, something spiritual. And imagine if the Lord for a moment would put us back in the state of our mind that we once were, and we're all sitting in this room, it would be really crazy in here. <laughs> but isn't it interesting that God's taken us at different times in our lives, transformed us, renewed us, and you want to know what's crazy? We're all family here. It's the body of Christ. Only God can do something like that. Amen? Amen. What great grace. Thank you.